Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Salon B, the new podcast from Berghahn Books. I'm Ben Parker-Jones, Assistant Marketing Manager at Berghahn, and I'm happy that you could join us as we embark on this exciting project. Historically, salons followed Horace's aim of poetry, either to instruct or delight, and we hope to do both as we bring you a gathering of academics and writers from a wide range of disciplines to discuss their work, read extracts, and talk about their academic life, all tied to a different monthly theme. This episode, in recognition of its Halloween release date, is themed around bones, and features bones both real and metaphorical. To begin today's salon, our senior humanities editor, Chris Chappelle, talks to the independent researcher Brian Hoggard about his book Magical House Protection, The Archaeology of Counter-Witchcraft. Published in hardback in 2019, and due out in paperback in January 2021, the book details the ways that people created and concealed objects to protect themselves from harmful magic in Britain and beyond from the 14th century to the present day. In this discussion, they touch on dried cats, sun symbols, witch bottles and concealed shoes, as well as what led Brian to his interest in these artefacts and how he built his theory based on them. I'm speaking here with Brian Hogard, the author of Magical House Protection, The Archaeology of Counter-Witchcraft. Situate yourself first disciplinarily, sort of where do you fit um, within kind of the academic ecosystem? Yeah, okay. Well, so, so although I am uh, labeled as an independent researcher, um, mm -hmm. this is actually academic research. Um, but for me, by the time I came to publication, uh, I was quite pleased that I wasn't affiliated with the university, particularly at that time. Mm -hmm. because universities do like to try and own your work if you're working with them um and also um not working with the university gave me the freedom to express myself in a way that i wanted mm -hmm. and to tell the story in the way that i wanted and i've always been very um committed to the idea that the language shouldn't be overly academic or overly jargonistic i want it to be accessible to as many mm -hmm. people as possible there's no reason why lay people can't understand very complex or very sophisticated folklore or archaeology or history ideas mm -hmm. if they're presented to them in the correct way and I find that a lot, of, a lot of academic books can be overly jargonistic and overly academic, and sometimes that's off-putting to the layperson. Mm -hmm. so I was always very committed to wanting this book to be more accessible. And, um, and when I was approaching publishers, which fortunately, of course, I landed with Berghahn, mm -hmm. but, um, but when I was approaching publishers, actually, that, that statement of mine with my proposal put quite a few of them off. They specifically wanted it to be academic and you know the same as all their other books. Mm -hmm. And they didn't like the fact that I wanted to use plain English for some concepts and things like mm -hmm. that. So, so yeah. So in terms of uh, where I am academically situated, mm -hmm. uh, I have a degree in history. And prior to that, I used to sort of, I've always been interested in archaeology mm -hmm. and have written for some sort of fringe archaeology uh, magazines going way back um, and done volunteering in museums, um, done quite a lot of local history research published a, a book about a hill near where I live called Breeden Hill, mm -hmm. looking at a mixture of history, archaeology, folklore, buildings, archaeology, that kind of thing. Just mm -hmm. sort of a tour of it, the heritage of that area, really. So, so yeah, I've sort of permeated with the past, I suppose, is what I would say. Uh-huh. We will, we, we will get around eventually to actually describing kind of what the book's about, but um, how, mm -hmm. did you, how did you find your way to these different, um, would uh, artifacts be the correct word? It would, yeah. Um, well, to be honest with you, I've always, I've always had a, a fascination with people's beliefs um, mm -hmm. and particularly um, sort of left field kind of beliefs, you know, off, off the wall kind of beliefs, the wacky ones mm -hmm. or the underground ones, you know, the sort of secret history, if you like, of um, people's beliefs, um, partly just out of curiosity. Um, and then I came across, well, during my degree, we did a module all about the history of witchcraft, which was pretty useful. Mm -hmm. um, it was quite nice to kind of... Um, see what kind of scholarship was out there on the history of witchcraft. And I found it really interesting. You know, again, it sort of tapped into this um, hidden beliefs kind of world. Mm -hmm. And um, and then because I've always uh, followed archaeology as well, I had a book by a chap called Ralph Merrifield that was published mm -hmm. in 1987 called The Archaeology of Ritual and Magic. And he was a guy who used to be the, um, I think he was deputy curator of the Museum of London. Mm -hmm. And so he was coming across all kinds of objects all the time, many of which were, you know, termed loosely ritual, 
and he was trying to sort of present them all to the world because these, these are the sort of objects that aren't normally reported on, aren't normally seen. He decided to write a book all about that, you know, some of the, the lesser known things that he'd come across in his life as mm -hmm. museum archaeologist. And, um, and in that book, there were two chapters uh, which corresponded to the period of the witch trials. Um, and some of the objects in there, I was just fascinated by it. And, and I realized straight away that in all my reading of the history of witchcraft, including brand new texts at that time, um, nobody was mentioning any of this archaeology. And, um, and I thought that was really strange, you know, because this, this archaeology clearly related to witchcraft and it's not appearing in any of the mainstream histories, which mm -hmm. claim to be describing what witchcraft was like. I said, well, it can't be describing what witchcraft is like because none of these objects are represented in these books. Right. Um, and so I decided to, that it was time to try and do some a sort of more systematic version of what Ralph Murphy had already done. He'd kind of come across this work, these objects through his work, um, but hadn't been systematic in his approach. You know, he was just sort of presenting what he'd found in London and, you know, some, sometimes elsewhere. And so I did a survey of archaeological units and museums asking them, you know, have you come across any finds like this? Do you have any in your collection? Just trying to get a feel for what might be out there. Mm -hmm. And I think I wrote to over a thousand different addresses in that first year of research. And I'd say about a third of them got back to me, which with, with objects. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, when you think that that's covering the whole of the United Kingdom at that time, um, I thought that was pretty amazing. And so that was kind of the beginning of my database and the beginning of me starting to get a picture of what people the sort of objects people used to conceal in their homes to ward off witchcraft. And in some cases, the sort of objects that they were doing witchcraft with, you know, so, um, yeah. And, and it became even more clear that there was this really, really arbitrary and unhelpful divide between history and archeology span when it came to witchcraft particularly, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it exists with other subjects as well. But, uh, I, I was really determined to attempt to bridge that divide and, uh, present the archeology span to the historians. <laughs> So, I, you know, uh, talk a bit about what are these objects? What are the different forms that they come in? And, um, you know, what do we, to the extent that they <clears throat> constitute a discrete category of something, what, like what is it that they do? Okay. So people used to think, well, what I would say, the conclusion I drew, which I'm going to start with that, okay. is that people believed that magic was um, a real vital force all around them and that it, it permeated everything, um, and it was as real as the elements, you know, as, you know, as we consider electricity to, be, electricity to be normal, they considered magic to be normal. They probably didn't even think of it in terms of magic. It was just a force that was always around mm -hmm. and it could be wielded for, for good or ill. And generally speaking, there was danger all around. So you're better off um, trying to find ways to safeguard all of your actions, all of your possessions, all of your objects, all of your loved ones. And, um, and in particular, um, you wanted to relax in your home. So your home was the focus of a lot of magic, basically. Um, and what we find when we look, you know, if you were to take an early modern thatched building, and if you were to take it apart layer by layer, sort of peel the, the thatch off slowly, peel the Watland door panels off, you know, inspect all the beams with a torch, mm -hmm. you know, there's a good chance you might find a dried cat in the thatch or tucked in between some um, lath and plaster panels. There could be some marks on the beams that are invoking the presence of the Virgin Mary or maybe invoking even the sun through a daisy wheel or you know there's other marks that you might find on the beams that are protecting or invoking the spirits to protect that area you might find sort of burn marks that have been put there in my opinion to provide a light on the other side if you like you know where this where this flame has burned away the surface of the wood we have a kind of ghost flame there now on the other side in the ghostly plane if you like providing illumination there stopping darkness from gathering in that area mm -hmm. um the daisy wheel the hexafoil pattern that people would draw with a compass is an ancient solar symbol performing a similar kind of function bringing light so that darkness can't lurk there then you have these marian marks invoking the virgin mary in various ways so she's protecting that area the dried cat it appears that that's some kind of spirit animal that's there to help try and be like a little guardian to protect your home mm -hmm. from minor supernatural uh, foes like the witch is familiar or perhaps even um, a spell that's been directed at your house or your property or yourself you might also find under the floor around the fireplace you might find a witch bottle which is a stoneware german bottle with a mean looking face on the neck and a big round belly so it's an anthropomorphic bottle 
and people would put urine into that and hair into that and bent pins and nails into that. And the idea was it would lure um, bad energies into thinking it's attacking you and it would plunge into the bottom and get trapped on this mess of dead pins within. Mm -hmm. Um, And you would also find things like concealed shoes in these buildings, quite often um, concealed, um, sometimes just popped on little ledges up inside the chimney. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be an association between um, shoes and um, trapping evil or trapping uh, demons in particular. There was a, a, an early 14th century saint who was unofficial in Britain called John Sean, and he's reputed to have cast the devil into a boot. And we actually have concealed shoes from that period onwards. And it seems like people thought they were some kind of protection against evil. And there is also this other concept with shoes that um, it tends to be just one shoe of a pair that's concealed. Um, there's about 10% that can be in pairs, but usually they're single. And they're always incredibly well worn. And so these are these, again, they're sort of sympathetic to you. you know, they only fit mm-hmm. you. It's like the Cinderella story, you know. And, um, and the idea is that any evil directed at you might be fooled into thinking this is you and attack it instead of you. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of putting it as a decoy in your walls. So it might act, you know, might intercede and help right. you out. Um, so, yeah, so we find concealed shoes, witch bottles, marks, cats. We also occasionally find horse skulls as well and um you referred to them the, as the most mysterious of the uh yeah because i think there's a direct connection with the ancient practices of you know burying horses and some of the beliefs about them being kind of um ways to transit from the other world of the dead to the living um and so there's a bit of that kind of mythology and belief around horses you know they're, they're obviously intrinsically linked with humans going back sort of 5,000 years at least, you know, mm-hmm. so, um, but, but certainly from about the 15th century, we find uh, horse skulls buried on their own in contexts where they seem to have been deliberately placed beneath floors. Um, and that's some, a practice that has a pr- identifiable kind of start date. Uh, well, yes. I mean, the earliest ones I've seen are from about the, the 15th century, mm-hmm. the ones that are just single horse skulls. Um, in this country I'm talking about, I'm sure that there are some in Iron Age contexts, like in Denmark and Germany and places like that. Mm-hmm. But um, but in terms of the practice that I'm talking about, where we find them within standing buildings, um, I'd say the earliest ones seem to be about the 15th century. And then there's this kind of weird kind of gap, like a hiatus, you know, in, in, the, in the archaeological record. There probably isn't one. I just haven't seen the evidence yet, you know. But um, but certainly from from prehistory, there was this tradition of um, ritual burial of horses, sometimes with humans, sometimes just on their own. Mm-hmm. And um, they seem to have been treated as very special creatures. But then, um, but my interpretation coming into the more modern age, I suppose, you know, we're still talking about the 15th century, it's still quite a long time ago. But, um, but you know, my interpretation of the use of the single horse skull seems to be that it's something to do with the way they look when they're defleshed. Um, mm-hmm. So they are kind of, you know, quite terrifying, quite scary. And I, and I think that maybe they were being used to scare off lesser spirits, lesser demons, and more terrifying than what might be trained to attack. Right. And, um, and we should mention that you have one on the cover of the book, I think, right? Yes, I do. I also have one <laughs> on my bookshelf behind my head. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, which is the same one, actually. Which oh, I okay. Nicknamed, which I nicknamed her, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I don't know if it's a male or a female, but um, it's uh-huh. her. Right, right. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I think also horses are incredibly uh, sensitive and alert and quite jittery, mm-hmm. um, and they would raise the alarm uh, if they thought danger was nearby mm-hmm. while alive. And I think there's a little bit of that benevolent relationship that humans have with horses um, that also rubs off on that. You know, so the idea is that um, that you can take a horse skull and it will serve you in a way, in the way that horses do in life, but also it's incredibly alert it's likely to be aware of any danger nearby Mm -hmm. and it's quite terrifying to look at and it might be able to scare things off um in death essentially right that's part partly where i'm coming from again i think there's there's possibly an element of foundation sacrifice as well that's like you kill an animal to kind of sanctify the the space it's kind of like to appease the spirit of place so that you don't you don't want to upset any local spirits if you're going to build a house because they might make the house fall down on you later on Mm-hmm. So you make an offering to them, and this is um, 
like one of the oldest human magical practices on the planet, I guess. Um, but yeah, um, <clears throat> so, so there is a, an example from the late 19th century, which Ralph Merrifield talks about, which I think he got from another folklore collection, um, which is where in somewhere in Norfolk, there was a building site for a chapel and um, the, the, build, the lad, the assistant, was sent off to get a horse's head from the local knacker's yard, which is where they would kill old horses. Mm-hmm. And then they brought it back, put it on a stake, poured some beer over it before they would start building it. And so it mm-hmm. seems like there is this kind of foundation ritual, if you like, before, before, you know, which they didn't, they weren't killing an animal. But I think originally the practice would have been to have killed an animal before proceeding with um, construction. But mm-hmm. it sort of degraded to the point, to the point by the end of the 19th century where they'd be happy just to get a horse's head from a local knacker's yard. But, it, but I think that tells us something about what's going on. You know, it could be a bit of foundation sacrifice. It could also be um, more spiritual. I think there's a bit of both going on at the same time, mm-hmm. a mixture of beliefs. How do you go about sort of extrapolating that? Because, I mean, obviously there, there are not accompanying instructions for how to <laughs> best use this shoe to kind of... No, it's, I mean, it is theorizing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not, there's no... Um, I can't say I can't say I've proved any of these ideas, but I think that that when you explore all the different ideas for why they might be there, these fit best with the beliefs that we know existed at the time, and they seem to suit the materials we're dealing with, and these concepts of um, when you when you kill something, it kind of flips over to this other state of being. Mm-hmm. This kind of basic belief in um, kind of the magic of materials, if you like, mm-hmm. that people had. Um, so yeah, they seem to be the best fit potentially. And, and also, you know, when you have cats consistently concealed in buildings where there's no way they could have got there on their own, you've got to think, why were they put there? Um, and you know, they're not visible. They're not findable. They don't present a threat to rats or anything. People, mm-hmm. you know, people have postulated maybe they were to scare vermin, but, but rats very quickly understand when something is dead or alive, you know? Right. And, um, so, you know, you've got to think what else might be going on, you know, and then you think about the way people used to think, you know, if you can, you try and tap into that, mm-hmm. tap into the way people used to think magically. You think, if I did believe in magic, what might this be doing, you know? And then when you look at, for example, the frequency with which we find shoes and cats and things like that, they're always or often in the same places. Um, and there's also this clear focus around the hearth with a lot of these objects. And you think, well, why is that? And it's because the hearth is always open to the sky. It's not protected like the other apertures in the building are. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so you, you, just, you kind of start to feel your way into it, if you like. And then you start to realize that um, there's focuses around door frames and window frames. Mm-hmm. And then you might find some of these bigger objects just in, in voids or in areas where there aren't any doors or windows. Um, but they seem to be covering that patch that hasn't been already protected. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I mean? And some houses seem to have all of it. Um, and also we do know that people did an awful lot of rituals, um, which I don't cover in the book because they've been well covered by other people mm-hmm. like Keith Thomas in his religion and the decline of magic is a really good example of that. But, uh, but you know, um, people would carry charms on them and they would, uh, say blessings before doing things to, to cast away devils and protect the area they're working in. And, um, they would even ingest herbs to protect themselves if they thought they were bewitched, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, and all of these objects kind of fit with those ways of thinking, um, but they're passive. You know, you put them in the building, and then you can sit back, and then they're working for you. Yeah, right, right. Theoretically, you know. Um, so you know, you've spoken a bit about um, you've spoken a bit about uh, kind of one of your aims as a as both a scholar and an educator is to kind of reach beyond a, a very specialized and uh, you know kind of a jargon oriented, um, you know, approach to this topic. I mean, is there, is there something about it that seems to draw people in? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people, people are fascinated by the whole notion of witchcraft, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and often, uh, they get excited by the idea of people having supernatural power and they imagine that maybe they could have some supernatural power. Mm-hmm. And then often they start dipping their toes in the water of modern pagan witchcraft, that kind of thing, which, you know, is a mixture of beliefs, some modern with sort of tokenistic older beliefs here and there, you know, it's you like Wicca and uh, yeah, that's the, if that's the proper umbrella to put that under. 
I suppose so, yeah. But there, there are there are um, pagan witches who would not describe themselves as part of Wicca. You know, okay. there are sort of independent uh, witches as well. But yeah, there's just a, a real mix of people out there who um, who think they can feel some kind of supernatural energy in their lives, and they're trying to interpret it and manipulate it and work with it. And then they label it witchcraft. And then there are some modern books with all kinds of uh, ideas in them about modern witchcraft, um, uh, which sometimes mixes with some of the old ideas of witchcraft, you know, which they get from history of witchcraft books, that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, I think that whole world of witchcraft and the unknown and the unexplained is just really excites people. And, um, and when they see that people were actually putting in these objects into their homes to protect themselves from witchcraft, that makes it seem more real, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so these, for these people, it was, and that's because for these people, it really was real. You know, they really did believe that witchcraft would explain all kinds of illnesses and hazards that you would encounter in very, you know, in, in everyday life. And they were desperate to find some remedy for those things. I mean, obviously, we know with modern science and forensics and police forces and et cetera, we know what the reasons for many of these things are um, with our modern medicine and everything. But, um, <clears throat> but people still believed that, um, you know, that their way of understanding misfortune was often via the supernatural. If you don't understand it, maybe something unexplained caused it, you know, and, and this led to all kinds of fears, essentially. And, and that becomes really interesting for people and the funny thing is when people find an object in their homes like like a, a witch bottle or a dried cat or a shoe um it doesn't matter how rational they are or how sensible they are how much they would poo poo those ideas if anybody else came to them with them they suddenly become deeply deeply paranoid about the supernatural in their own home and they become terrified of these objects leaving their own home um i've known people who are like lawyers who were terrified of me taking a bottle away for forensic analysis in case something bad happened while it was out of the house. Mm-hmm. Um, and these are people who, as I said, would completely deny, you know, had they not found this in their own home, they'd probably deny the reality of the supernatural full stop. But then they, they find something in their own home and this crack opens in their little secure, rational world. Uh-huh. And suddenly the supernatural fears are there, the same ones that the people who put it there in the first place probably had. Up next, we have A.E. Garrison, a graphic ethnographer, reading an edited version of her chapter from the book Blurring Timescapes, Subverting Erasure, Remembering Ghosts on the Margins of History, edited by Sarah Surface Evans, Amanda E. Garrison, and Keisha Supernant. Titled Boneyard Quiet, A Ghost Story, the piece looks at the American Rust Belt city of Lansing, Michigan, centering on a bridge born and destroyed in a century. In its printed version, this piece took the form of a hybrid comic book essay. Here, it is rendered as a spoken performance by the author, with a soundscape made up of new and archival audio. There is a care to be taken in remembering. Some scholars insist that once an event has a story, a retelling, it is no longer true no longer a happening, but a story of a story through time. Still others would suggest that our memories are complicated understandings, inscribed or written by those in our social worlds into our own experiences. But remembering a place that has never been is wholly something else. And I don't mean that any social figures I might conjure in the telling of this story did not exist, but that in my time, I've never seen them. Their forms are with me nonetheless. I find, however, that the space is essential for a haunting that moves forward through the fogginess of scattered pasts. What can be seen from a distance is not always the clearest vision. What seems most likely is not always what happens. In the spring of 2016, I began to explore the city of Lansing, Michigan on foot. I lived in the heart of the city, in a neighborhood referred to as Moores Park. The neighborhood rests on the edge of Rio Town affectionately and appropriately named by the city's residents for its history in a mammoth automotive past. It was not my intention to find anything necessarily. I set out on a hot summer day along the Grand River. The Lansing River Trail Recreation Park System provides an asphalt path that leads along the river across from the behemoth Otto C. Eckert Municipal Power Plant. 
across the water to buttress the city's only remaining GM plant, Lansing Grand River Assembly, maker of Camaros. I'd never been so close to a factory. These walks would take me all over the city. Walking over ground I later discovered was the predictable trace of the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern Railroad. Under pavement, under concrete, under more asphalt, under traffic, under Interstate 496, which ripped its way neatly through the heart of the city, making all around it a blur of irrelevance. Roofs and treetops peeked over its concrete shoulders, the river invisible to anyone strange to the town. This trail would take me along the bank, sometimes busy with people in their pursuit of fitness, often solitary, never quiet. The trail snaked along the banks all the way downtown, revealing secrets along the way. Empty, partial concrete foundations, half submerged in the current. Curious, chain-laced, dead-end streets with no beginning, whose edges were jagged asphalt drops into the Grand River. Painted buildings with no windows, repurposed structures with empty parking lots, and a heaviness that told nothing a silence around a noise that was unidentifiable to me, a buzzing of ghosts, a cacophony of whispers from a time I could not know. The heavy breath of a past is a hard thing to unpack in an unfamiliar place. Stories were sitting on the surface at every turn, every street corner, every rise of a hill, a pile of rubble in the middle of an empty field. But so much of what I could see told me nothing other than something had been there, something larger that bloomed in the weight of the busy quiet. It was not as though the past of Lansing was not documented. I take much of my knowing and telling here from the works of Lisa Fine, a gifted socio-historian, and from the generous librarians working throughout the Michigan library system to protect and preserve these documents of times that never were, were it not for photos. The only visible markings of Lansing's past are historic signs created and erected by the Federal Department of the Interior that note the site of the Diamond Rio factory, detailing in brief the life of Ransom E. Olds and the history of the auto industry in the city's heart. Along the main street in Rio town, signs told anyone interested about the history of Oldsmobile, Lansing's claim to place in the story of Michigan, of Rust Belt cities, of the car, in America. And then, of course, the names of the streets were quick impositions of what residents and visitors would take for granted, someone who mattered in some other time, but who no longer mattered to anything but navigation. Haunting, nonetheless. Ghosts of spaces. Ghosts in places. Avery Gordon describes haunting as a particular way of knowing what has happened or is happening. In pieces, we discover the lives we fictionalize to tell a story of social realities, fictions of the real. Haunting as uncovering a time when the names of the streets were living people, making their money, leading the city, while their fortunes fueled the policy and practice of Michigan's capital. These are all markers to conjure the curiosity of some other time, a beginning. Authenticity, after all, is important to U.S. culture. Originality and invention individuality embodied so that the genius belongs to one and not many. There are other hauntings, however, other ghosts, whose shadows aren't dissolved by the bright lights of historic relevance, not directly. Markers are rarely dedicated to everyday life. The lives of those who go unremembered by the powers of history's telling are fundamental elements of the progress of a future under control. These hauntings and their boneyards where the surface of a foundation still grips the barbed wire, secured there once by someone invested in protecting whatever it was, in wait for nothing, crumbled bits of other times, made by other hands, troubled by the troubles of their lives. But there is a danger in remembering something that never happened. As I continued to walk through the city every day of that summer, my curiosity became consumed with piecing together a past of a place that was the prototype of the American dream. Labor, unions, democracy, equality, sidewalks, swimming pools, 
Or what I imagined a dream like that would look like here at the bottom of the peninsula. Public works projects funded by the monies of the tycoons at the local and national levels in conjunction with the federal government fueled other growth. Workers lived down the hill or across the river from their bosses and local capitalists. And while it would be reductive to assume that all of the folks in the heart of Lansing at the turn of the 20th century were white, the variation among labor resided primarily in ethnicity. The houses in my neighborhood and the neighborhoods I walked through were all close together. There were some empty lots next to houses, not quite big enough to fit another house. Curbs broke in curves to nowhere and sidewalks from the street went right to nothing. There were collective movements as the white residents of the city fled it around the same time the federal government opened the floodgates on cheap property just outside city limits. The city did not die, even if wounded, and it was not immune to the seismic waves cracking the earth of urban spaces all along the Rust Belt. Thousands lost their jobs. Whole neighborhoods emptied out. The temperature of Lansing dropped. But there was everyday life nonetheless. People walked to work, bought houses, had children, mended broken hearts, and struggled under the consequences of policies made by those looking out from somewhere else. Familiar tellings of one past make for a silencing of the justice that would be served to those whose stories disappear in the murky waters of power's heroic tales of itself. Federal programs would allow the government to claim residents' property, buying their rights for less than the property was worth in many cases. The building of interstate connectors through cities was subsidized by the federal government's slum clearance urban renewal projects. The interstates allow us to drive over boneyards of neighborhoods not long gone. The city's landscape sits on thin layers of other times. It is impossible for any of us to know the everyday lives of the people who walk through the city in the time of its beginning. As a trusted friend and colleague asked me, why would anyone save these things? Neighborhoods, parks, pools, and bridges? It is precisely because we would not know to ask about these spaces that they're important. And not only the story of the bridge or pool, but the people around those spaces, the people who used them, the people who planned them, the people who wrote the check, and the people who destroyed them. In the end, they are just a bridge and just a pool. It matters, however, that they mattered. I can only claim that a bridge mattered because it crossed a river. I can only say it mattered because it provided a way for people to get across this part of the Grand River in this part of the city for a very long time. And then, like the city itself, it was forgotten and left to rot. Unlike the city, however, the bridge disappeared, and with it the shared experience of its crossing. The changes to the cityscape are only captured in time by photographs. These captive seconds show a different world than the horizon of the present. And yet, I can't help but want to see what was seen in those moments. Postcards from a time that looked so different, but not unfamiliar to me. Archived photographs of bridges, neighborhoods, city streets, whose bricks lie under layers of layers of repair, repave, resurface, and repeat. What follows is a story of obsession, haunting, and ghosts, I place myself in different times and form only, and to ask questions that incite the ghosts I have seen to emerge and show themselves to anyone who would seek them out, even as they evade notice and dreams of a past that never happened. If they whisper from the shallows and materialize in opacity to tell their stories, what would they tell us? Would they tell us that they saw the slow decomposition of themselves and the neglect of the public? Would they tell us that their rememberings disappointed their realities, sharing the struggles of achieving the impossible in the American dream? A warning, perhaps, to remember intentionally? To proceed with critical caution? Or most likely a whole symphony of other stories, unrelated to anything but the very real doings of everyday life? Demolition by neglect makes for treacherous footing. It is in this uncertainty that we begin. A ghost is just the sign that tells you a haunting is taking place. 
The ghost is not simply a dead or missing person, but a social figure, and investigating it can lead to that dense site where history and subjectivity make social life. The ghost or the apparition is one form by which something lost or barely visible or seemingly not there to our supposedly well-trained eyes makes itself known or apparent to us in its own way, of course. The way of the ghost is haunting, and haunting is a very particular way of knowing what has happened or is happening. Being haunted draws us effectively, sometimes against our will, and always a bit magically into the structure of feeling a reality we come to experience, not as cold knowledge, but as transformative recognition. Follow me. Souls are mixed with things. Things are mixed with souls. That is only part of the story. On this particular day in January, I set out to document a mystery. There were these bones, you see, we animate place in our imaginations. We construct it in our minds. Sticking out from the riverbank with no marker, no gravestone, no presence of a memory to tell me the story of its living. The place possesses us and we possess it. I had to find out more. We belong to the place and the place belongs to us. As I made my way through the slushy, icy streets of Rio town, questions of the public Demolition by neglect only flickered. The weather made being outdoors nearly unbearable, spitting and freezing in the subtle, numbing wind. I had to alternate hands and coat pockets. The wind bit my fingers through my gloves. Somewhere between the actual and the imaginary, ghosts might enter without affrighting us. I did not know exactly where to go. The strange made itself big and looming. At the same time that I could not resist its calling, I hope to find bones. I hope to catch a ghost walking over the landscape from the corner of my eye to glimpse what Michael Mayerfield Bell calls the aura of our web of social relations. Follow me. Sanborn insurance maps showed that some parts of the city had changed. While the traces of others remained through the layers of time and infrastructural tissue, I found maps to show me a layer of another body I found historic documents that showed me, neighborhoods that bordered factories, data of everyday life, connecting two sides. It was that spirit of the everyday, I realized, then driving me through the wintry desolation that January that brought me back to my seeking. It was the map that sent me out into the freezing afternoon. It was a map that showed me something I could not see. It was a map that revealed Fictions of the real and the ghost of a bridge at the end of River Street. Transformative recognition. Neglect that would predict demolition. Ghosts might enter without affrighting us. The bridge serves as a node in structures of social relations. The strands connect all those living in various social worlds. As a sociologist on foot, it is not only the bridge I search for, but the traces of everyday lives, past and present, in the structure and boneyards of the city. I search for how these lives cross down the cracked sidewalks of the city. The doing of building together matters to everyday life. The sidewalks, just like the bridges, were often contracted by cities across the country to the cheapest bidder with the best connections. There's a process to the bid, a process to the application, a process preceding action done by people in positions to make decisions for everyone else. This is not merely a story of this ghostly form disappeared with its traces of concrete bone matter left behind. No, for we're not haunted by the materiality of our everyday lives because of the brick or the rebar or the pebbles in the pavement. Indeed, we are haunted if we are haunted by each other. We are haunted by the humanity that connects us to one another over time, through the meaning we share in objects, connected through the stories we tell, the lives we live, and the technologies we make to progress these lives forward. Riverbanks, connected. Furniture without memories, 
I returned to my friend's question of who cares about this bridge as one whose answer could lie in truly sociological principles. The story is about haunting and about the crucial way in which it mediates between institution and person, creating the possibility of making a life, of becoming something else in the present and for the future. Imagining experiences connected to history and to the very real institutional policies and practices that organize our lives. The birth and death of this bridge are regulated by governing bodies, just as the slow dismemberment of public space comes. The bridge was gone, and with it, the access to which people had who used it to work and back or wherever. Its use became itself a problem for some residents of the neighborhood, even as its use in decades before had been a consideration the city had to take in its maintenance. Its building was unremarkable. History does not tell its story as it would of its sisters. The Kalamazoo Street Bridge, the Washington Street Bridge, the Grand River Bridge all had their notice and commemoration in time, frozen for the memories of those who had never seen iterations of these public structures in the past. The River Street Bridge did not have the same fate. It was this reality, this silence in the record, that made it so difficult to find that bridge had ever truly existed. This is not to say I could not see it through time, but that its material absence made visions of it, informed by the romance of a past on paper, only imaginary. Much of this area was low income by the 1970s. Why spend to fix it? Why did they demolish it? Was it for the interstate? I felt the possession beset me. I imagine the trauma escapes theorized by Maria Tamerican to be the spaces we come to know demolished, destroyed, or closed off to us when access used to be unlimited. Could trauma escapes be just as easily considered in the slow decomposition of a public structure? A restriction of funding? A slow disintegration of investment in what would be the public? Traffic changes when the bridge is gone. What was once a through street becomes a dead end. River Street runs into both the Cedar at its south and the Grand on its north side. I am the only one out here, at least the only one visible. The only one in the spitting, freezing rain, standing on parts of a sidewalk that were laid in 1923, blocks from the power plant, the pool, and down the street from where this ghost was once real. The Department of Public Works stamped its panel of concrete and moved on. How many feet have rested here for only seconds in stride, where my booted feet, frozen inside socks, now stands? It was this discovery, the connections between the document of history, of an intentional telling, that drove the obsession of finding its image and this bridge's life that connected two sides of the Grand River. I captured the absence of the bridge in my own photographs. It was not there, but I imagined its narrow shoulders, the slow putter of cars over time, crossing it, crossing it again. The cracking of wood in the cold ice of the winter when first it provided crossing to people on horses, in carriages, on foot. The bridge began to take shape in my imagination as not only a structure now missing, but a touchstone for a whole neighborhood truck routes, bus routes, bike rides, and getaways. I imagine the responses of people familiar coming back to this spot once crossable, only to find it closed, impassable. When I finally found the images of the River Street Bridge, the puzzle's picture was clear, but it was just a bridge. The pictures revealed an abandoned body, one crumbling, forgotten, ignored, I see the feet touching this pavement. Neglected. Everyday life in the pavement. Everyday life in our steps. Everyday life in the walk to work. Everyday life in the walk back home again. So what are the disruptions to everyday life by the absence of this bridge? Untangling the complications of demolition by neglect and practice by governing or owning participants in public life yielded frustration and discouragement. Impossible to prove if the definition applied to literal property of historic value, 
The public was a structure of historic value, but not of property and profit. Social gain costs money. Progress is expensive. Headline, Lansing State Journal, 1982. Bridge must be replaced. The bridge should be closed for the safety of everybody. Otherwise, vandals will be able to escape by foot across the bridge, while police cars will be unable to follow them. Meg Getz, Cherry Hill resident. I heard something else in this talk. I heard vandals and escape echoing from the top of Cherry Hill. I recognized the language. The bridge was already in its death throes. It had permitted only pedestrians for years. But there was no replacement. As the headline suggested, the bridge at the end of River Street had a long life of uncertainty that ended quite fatefully for a city pinching its pennies. By 1924, its fate was under discussion. Traffic did not warrant the sinking of resources into its upkeep. Many factories moved from the banks of the Grand to other places around the city, and with the progression of transportation and other technologies, not to mention the social movements that nearly a hundred years inevitably unfold, the fate of the River Street Bridge might have been its inevitable destruction. I read about Interstate 496, opened in 1970, and how it changed the lives of the people who were displaced by federal policies and practices. It changed the lives of commuters, making their time between work and home shorter and faster. It lasted until 1987 before it was disappeared by the city. The city contracted out the labor to take it down. Pieces of it loom greenish-gray just below the surface of the river, scattered on its banks. I could not stop thinking about it. From its early beginnings as a wooden bridge, it seemed to serve its purpose for only a moment. Whatever our experience, if demolition by neglect is in motion, how does the neglect process make a trauma escape from everyday encounters with that social figure? People reported great sadness over the raising of their homes for the installation of the interstate and over the raising of the Rio plant in the center of the city. The loss of these spaces resonates with people, not necessarily because of the structures themselves, but because of the people, the meaning, associated with the memories of those spaces. We haunt one another with the objects that we make. We remain when we have gone through the structures and pieces of the world we share. We watch the bridge die and our memories of its life or of the life of any object we share in our social public worlds connect our experiences. These reference points are merely pieces of the world we share. It is the relationship that people have with one another around these spaces that makes the spaces matter. With its death, trauma, not debilitating trauma, not like that of direct violence, rather the slow, painful departure of something, of an object, of meaning. Who cares indeed? This is not the story of the bridge as it stands alone or once did. This story is a story of people and of those whose lives shared through connections to and through the social figures in our physical public worlds. These spaces of sharing are contentious in the United States. The knowledge people keep and the stories people share connect us in ways that laws and policies cannot. Or at least restrictive power has a more difficult time administering control and order when communities come together and share space and experience. When information or knowledge is exclusive, the boundaries that benefit power to keep remain in place. Ideologies like racism, misogyny, and homophobia and their keepers maintain their grips. This is the danger nestling in the public, or at least history shows the consequences, sometimes fatal, of what happens when people separated come together for common reasons. Strategies of alienation are just that, practices within ruling relations that organize everyday experiences. Demolition by neglect as a practice organized the experiences of those whose everyday lives involved or included these objects of meaning. If we walk over it every day, we watch it approach and it is familiar. If we are afraid on it and dread crossing it, but can't take the time to go around to a sturdier bridge, blocks and traffic away, that fear might linger there in everyday life. 
From my return to my warm house down the street from the power plant that cold January day to these years later, the mysteries of that bridge and the everyday lives that knew it haunt me still. The world as yet remains an enchanted place. It is within reach, the vision that would expose the ghosts that most don't remember. It is within grasp, a different way to see the decisions made in the past. Between institution and person, creating the possibility of making a life, of becoming something else in the present and for the future. A ghost story. To close the episode, we have the poet Marion McCready, author of two poetry collections, Tree Language from 2014 and Madame Acoss from 2017. Here, she reads her poem Apple Trees, first published in Critical Survey. In folklore, sometimes a newborn child is associated with a newly planted tree with which its life is bound up in. When my children were very small, I planted apple trees in my garden. This poem is called Apple Trees. She's planting apple trees in the garden, one for each of her children. She digs holes for the young saplings, slicing through the earth, through wire worm and click beetle, heaving shovelful after shovelful of soil onto a blue tarpaulin. With her bare hands, she pans the mud for stones, digs up rocks, fist-sized, builds a cairn out of them, a sort of totem at the bottom of the garden. And when she's dug deep enough, carefully sits the young trees in place, tams their roots, fills the holes up, adding water in a layer of mulch. At night she feels them growing, the way she feels her children's bones lengthen in their sleep. From the moonlit window overlooking the garden, she can feel the roots unfurling, stretching towards her under the earth. A reminder that both of today's featured books can be found on our website, berghahnbooks.com and the poem can be read in Volume 28, Issue 3, of the journal Critical Survey. If you would like to submit a poem for the journal, you can email criticalsurveypoetry at gmail.com. To stay up to date with Salon B, visit berghahnbooks.com forward slash podcast. We've got plenty of interesting content coming up over the next few months, including an episode on the theme of youth and play due in November, so please subscribe. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Salon B, and thank you for listening.